it's a first talk in the last session of the day. I'll be back. I'm going to do some more talks that will go back to the rest of the video. I don't think. Okay, hello all. So um, I'll talk about this work we had at uh, Stock this summer, joint with Ankit Pritish and Dimitri. We also have a follow-up work, maybe it's online this week, it's, uh, also with Rob Robert. So finally, we get some application for this abstract machinery that um, we presented at Stock. The upshot of the whole work is, well, it's in the title. So uh, it's machinery where you can start from lower bounds improve complexity, resolution lower bounds. Normally, easy to prove, at least not terribly difficult. And the machinery allows you to derive more or less as a black box lower bounds in monotone circuit complexity. Typically considered difficult to prove lower bounds for monotone circuits. So it's a, a lifting theorem again that really works in the uphill direction. Actually, the downhill direction why monotone circuit lower bounds yield proof completely lower bounds. That's an old thing from the 90s. It's called monotone feasible interpolation. I think it was mentioned in the, the boot camp. So this work you could see as proving a converse to monotone uh, feasible interpolation. So I'll just throw out uh, an application, maybe the cleanest uh, we can derive using this uh, machinery. And that's to show an exponential lower bound for some monotone variant of the XOR SAT function. So I have to be careful. How do you define mono, uh, a monotone version of XOR SAT? Uh, and you have to be um, clever in order to make it a monotone function. Here's the definition. So you first imagine listing all possible XOR constraints on um, n variables, let's say ternary XOR constraints. So for each triple of variables, you have an equation saying their parity should equal zero or one, and there are n cubed roughly many such uh, equations. So the input to my XOR sat will be a subset <coughs> of these constraints, just given by an indicator vector. So the input is for each row, I pick whether I want to include this constraint in my uh, CSP or leave it out. So something like this. That's an input to XOR SAT. Specifies a subset of them. And I say that this evaluates to true if the set is unsatisfiable. So I say unsatisfiable because I want it to be a monotone function. I want it to be the case that if I flip a 0 to a 1 in the input, so that means I'm adding an XOR constraint to my set, can only turn the function from false to true. But that's why I'm saying, yes, inputs are unsatisfiable. Small detail just to make the function uh, monotone. So we can show an exponential lower bound uh, for XORSAT. And it's interesting because XORSAT is a really easy function. So you know Gaussian elimination can, can solve it for you. In fact, um, there are really efficient algorithms for linear algebra, classical results. And in particular, XORSAT is even in uh, NC2, so speedy parallel algorithms. So you could interpret this as, oh, that's interesting. It's a huge monotone versus non-monotone separation. Uh, I think the previous example, the only one I know of, is a Tardoshi's function, so that's um, some function you define out of the Lovash theta function for graphs. And to compute that, you need to solve a semi-definite program. So it's in P, but we don't know of better upper bounds for this function. Well, here's an even easier function. Um, to milk this a little bit more, you can also say that this is the first exponential separation between monotone circuits and monotone span programs over GF2. So XOR SAT you can compute with monotone span programs. So monotone circuit complexity high, but monotone span program complexity low. The other, other direction Robert's work handled. So they're now separated in both directions exponentially. I guess I could still say that uh, another monotone versus non-monotone candidate is the perfect matching function. Um, so widely conjectured that you need exponential size monotone circuits. Only a quasi-polynomial lower bound is known. But even perfect matching, it's, it's not quite an NC, it's in randomized NC. So this is even slightly better than that. So yeah, it's sold. 
this is this is interesting. But yeah, it's just one thing you can get out of this machinery. In fact, we can prove similar lower bounds over any field, not just for GF2 equations, but over any field. Um, okay, so the way this project started out was really, uh, so Dimitri was telling me about a characterization of circuit size in the language of communication complexity. <laughs> and so this was roughly a year ago, and I hadn't heard about this before, which was surprising. I guess we all know about the characterization of formula size uh, in the language of communication complexity, namely um, determinist protocols and Gartner victorson games. But Rasparov in the mid-90s came up with a circuit version of this. Uh, maybe it's not well known. I, I, I wasn't taught that. I, some deficiency in my education. I mean, I, I blame Tony. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's really important because, at least to me, this mere characterization is a kind of a conceptual breakthrough because it's, if you view these models from the right perspective, it kind of suggests a lifting theorem to be proved. I couldn't imagine that such a thing, uh, couldn't even formulate uh, um, a theorem in this direction without seeing this a kind of a top-down characterization of circuits. Um, so I'm going to make sure that nobody lives today without um, understanding this Rasparov's characterization. I'm going to spend some time on it. What Rasparov showed is that monotone circuits are characterized by the communication analog of PLS. So, so PLS, polynomial local search, is one of these classes of total NP search problems in Turing machine complexity. Problems that are total because of the principle that every DAG has a sink. And there's a natural communication analog of that. And what Rasparov showed is, I'll define uh, the communication version of this in a minute, but he showed that this characterizes this both a monotone and non-monotone version of this, but for us, the monotone circuit complexity of a function, really the logarithm of it, um, is the PLS communication complexity of the monotone Karchner Victorson game. So, I mean, already we have a communication model that cries out, what's the query analog? So that's how this characterization suggests uh, a lifting theorem to be proved. But yeah, let me define communication PLS and uh, explore this, this characterization. <coughs> Is that also true for non-monotone for non -monotone logo bounds? So generally, circuit complexity is just a general Gosh, make this again without the monotonicity condition. Okay, thanks. So this, by the way, means that P versus NP is just a question in communication complexity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the definition of a PLS protocol. I define it as a, a solving a two-party uh, search problem. So generally, uh, Alice gets an input from X, Bob gets an input from Y, and they need to find some output symbol that satisfies this relation. So it's just a, a general search problem. You can think concretely of monotone Karchman victors and games if you want. So the protocol consists of a set of vertices, so maybe this set, it's a fixed set, and each node here is labeled with a candidate solution and an associated communication protocol. So if you recall the classical definition of PLS, it, it involves an implicitly defined graph, implicitly defined by um, a small circuit. Well, in this definition, I just replace circuits with protocols. It's each node is associated with a protocol that locally describes uh, this graph. So if I fix an input and I run a protocol as a node, supposed to output a description of uh, the neighborhood of the node in a graph. So it outputs two pieces of data, a candidate successor node, and an integer label, which is the potential, um, I call it the potential associated with a node. So somehow the resulting graph needs to be a DAG, and here's how I define it. So let's call it G that results on a fixed input x and y. You take x and y and you run this protocol for each of the nodes. 
So you have two pieces of information attached to each node. And then you define it. There's an no, uh, edge from this node to this node if this node thinks this is its candidate successor <coughs> and the potential decreases along the edge. So maybe the potential is 10 and here it's 8. So if these two conditions are hold, candidate successor and the potential decreases, I put an edge there. So the potential, it's, uh, it's there to guarantee that the resulting graph is really a DAG because you know, when, it, when you follow edges, the potential needs to decrease, so you never create cycles. But how do you define uh, the potential of a vertex? The potential is associated with an edge. It's, so it's associated with a node, and I say I put an edge if well, the source node has a bigger oh, potential. Oh, so the protocol gives not a potential of the successor, but potential of the node. That's right. Oh, OK. So it defines a DAG syntactically. And so we have to have some sinks. And I say that it's correct on this input if the sinks correspond to feasible solutions. So. have a node in this graph, which is a sink. OK, so then the associated label is a feasible solution for the input x and y. So for any such problem, you can ask, what's the most concise PLS protocol that uh, solves it in this sense? Concise here meaning the. Um, Complexity measure is something like this. The, the cost of a protocol I define as the log of the number of nodes you're using and the communication cost of the protocols. Let's say the maximum over all nodes of the communication cost. So my notation for the number of bits the protocol communicates. So that's the whole definition. So if you instantiate this for a monotone caution Richardson game, so then this is what Rasper approved. It's the log of the number of nodes. So this is the number of bits the protocol communicates. That's just my notation. Okay. So let me um, sketch one direction just to kind of explore this definition a bit. So here's a monotone circuit. I want to derived from a monotone circuit, one of these PLS protocols. And here's how, what I do. I define this graph again, gx, y. The nodes in my protocol is just the gates and, and the input, inputs. And in order to define this uh, DAG on top of this, I'll first say that a gate is feasible, so let me denoted by just highlighting it. So a highlighted gate is feasible if Alice's input evaluates that gate to true and, and Bob evaluates to zero. So by the way, the top gate is always feasible because the top gate completes the function and in a monitor cartridge Richardson game, I'm given yes and no inputs to, to the players. And moreover, feasibility can be decided by a, a protocol that just communicates two bits. You know, Alice knows this value, Bob knows this value, they exchange. So let me draw some nodes that are feasible. And note that if an input is feasible, it exactly means that it's a solution in the monotone question Victorson game. It means that two players evaluate this positive variable differently. They found a positive difference if, if this happens. There are some unfeasible nodes, and I'm just going to define their potential as, OK, a large number infinity, and make them point to the top node. And then I'm going to observe that if you're feasible as a node, at least one of your children needs to be feasible. So that's going to be your successor. So that says that if you have a gate where you have 
a positive difference, Alice has a yes gate, Bob has a no gate, it must be that one of the incoming gates also witnesses such a positive difference. It could be both, but um, you can figure out a canonical uh, successor, one of the feasible um, children. So maybe like this. So that defines a DAG, and all these relationships, these edges can be uh, described by constant um, co protocols that communicate constantly many bits. And the sinks are naturally associated with coordinates. They, they are the uh, solutions to the monotone gauge predictors game. So that's basically the whole proof. Um, it's really nice. The converse holds, but this is slightly more complicated, so I'm not going to go into it. What are the potentials? Yeah. Okay, so unfeasible infinities. If you're feasible, then the height of the node, so that you can have these successes. Good point. Well, that's the name of the gate, right? The gate order. Order. Oh, it's a topological sort. Yeah. yeah. I see. Okay, so this is really nice, but now you're asking, of course, okay, what is the query complexity analog if you have a communication model? Well, you can canonically define it, and I denote that model by PLS, the decision tree version. In the query world, we're going to study, as in Robert's talk, these um, search problems of low certificate complexity, which it turns out with a lot of generality, they're always of this form. They're associated with unsatisfiable KCSPs, so F here is a unsatisfiable KCSP, K is, let's say, a constant. And as input, you're given an assignment to the underlying variables, let's say it's a Boolean CSP, so N variables. It's unsatisfiable, on, so some constraints need to be violated. The problem is to find one of them. So it's a query complexity problem. You can ask what is the decision tree complexity of such a search problem. It turns out it captures the tree-like resolution size of refuting F. But here we're interested in these DAG-like models. So then we look at, again, the query analog of PLS. So how would you define something like this? The definition is exactly the same, except whenever I have mention a protocol here, I just instead have a decision tree. So each of the nodes are associated with a decision tree. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but from this definition for the communication version, um, you might as well just have the communication protocol be one bit be mm -hmm. because you can have uh, an additional state keep track of the conversation so far and just have one bit that says what, you know, so then you just append the next bit of the conversation. I'm not sure I follow. Uh, it's the only yeah, obvious. Got a, a communication game, a communication graph with a protocol. I'll define a new graph where the vertices are orig pairs, original vertex, and partial conversation. So as a, uh, associated with a node, there's no unique path you can reach it. There could be many no, paths no, to reach no, it. No, no, I meant over on the other board. So say you're given a PLS protocol. Mm -hmm. It has a set of vertices and, um, and a um, communication protocol on every vertex. So I'm going to define a new set of vertices that's a pair, original vertex, Partial conversation of the protocol. Yeah, it's true. You can. There's like normal forms for these things, so you right. can make uh, uh, adjusted so definition. For decision trees, we should be able to do the same thing, and it's basically like you query. It's just going to be like querying at a vertex. What is the successor, probably? Yeah. So there are different normal forms. So it's going to be, it's going to be like a, a branching, a branching program. Well. I want to avoid this branching program connection. This is a lot weaker model than a branching program. So we can prove lower bounds for resolution. We can't prove lower bounds for branching program. That's a usual pitfall. So there's, you shouldn't think of this as we start at the root, you follow a unique path and output this. Yes. There's, there are more guarantees. For any node that's feasible, 
you can trace down to a leaf and find a solution, right. which is a lot stronger than just the kind of canonical path yielding a solution. Um, so I think the, the model is going to look a lot like the branches. You may be like changing the, the goal. Maybe, maybe. I feel like Dimitri did this in his, his, his yeah, so there are different, in the paper I actually use a different normal form for these, but oh, okay. I like this conceptual approach that you just, that you don't think anything, you just take a Turing machine definition and replace circuits with protocols and decision trees, it's canonical. <coughs> okay, so it turns out that this simply captures resolution with. It's the same proof almost. Um, maybe I won't give it in detail, but roughly, as you could replace in this picture, you know, think of the, instead of a circuit, I have a resolution proof. I'm a, so I have uh, at the leaves the constraints of the, my formula F, and clause is where resolution derives from two clauses, a third. It's logically sound. And you could derive one of these decision tree PLS versions out of a resolution proof by just modifying your definition of feasible. Now you're feasible if so a clause in a proof is feasible. If so I'm now fixing an input. There's only one input now, this uh, uh, Boolean assignment, if the clause is falsified. In the resolution proof, the top clause is the contradictory clause. It's always feasible. And if two clauses imply a third, and this is falsified under a particular assignment, it must be that one of its children are. And to decide feasibility, well, to decide this condition, you need to query a number of bits of x determined by the width of the clause. It's roughly why at least one direction of this immediately holds. So is this a semantic resolution? Equal syntactic. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. So as in all lifting theorems, we can hope to characterize a communication version of this search problem. So the original search problem composed with a gadget. And the main theorem is that we do get an equality. But it's somewhat abstract in that if we want to end up with monotone circuit lower bounds, so far we can just start with resolution lower bounds and get some lower bounds for these lifted search problems associated with unsatisfiable CSPs. But some creativity is sometimes needed to find at last a, a reduction from one of these types of problems to monotone cartridge to circuits. Previous work has given some reductions, okay, uh, we give more. And in fact, uh, this kind of uh, XOR sat or more generally C sat function, um, it gives a kind of a simple framework where there's a, a uniform way in which you can start with an unsatisfiable C CSP. So let's fix any set of constraints. If some C CSPs are hard to refute in resolution, you can run through this machinery and end up at a function which is basically generalization of XOR sat and get an exponential lower bound. We lose something in the exponent because of the size of the gadgets we need to use. So <coughs> constant size gadgets would maybe yield strictly exponential lower bounds. That's one open problem. So, so you get that the um, long and the circuit size of F is a constant factor of the uh, resolution width, is that right? Yeah, okay, so there are constants uh, implicit. In but it's theta of, so the yeah. Okay, so I think I'm almost out of time. I just want to mention one direction. Like this, there was this PLS communication model, and I just think it's such an obvious question to ask. You know, what happens for other TFNP subclasses? PLS is just one, and apparently nobody's asked this before, as far as I know. 
So we thought about it a little bit, and here's what we know. So we have PLS, with, which is circuit. OK, there are other classes, something called continuous local search at the very bottom. Functional P, which, whose communication analog is deterministic protocols. You could say that this captures formulas. That's the Kashmir Victorson characterization. There are other classes, like the pigeonhole class. Nobody's really studied. We don't know how to prove explicit lower bounds for the communication analog of this. Nor can we find any models of computation that would you know, allow such a characterization. Um, however, final punchline, there's a class called the parity argument. And, and for this class, we can find a model of computation that captures it. Does anybody have, have a guess for it? If you don't, haven't seen this before, what would be? Yay! Call <laughs> <laughs> a GF2. So I don't know. So, so this was 95. 80 something. Why haven't people explored this? Characterizations, you can also ask to separate classes. For example, our main theorem, if you interpret in this language, XOR sat is easy for span programs over GF2. So it's sort of easy for the communication class, hard for PLS, that's what the theorem says. So it implies an exponential separation, dashed arrow meaning no inclusion. But very few of these separations are known. So in query complexity, pretty much everything is understood, all the relative complexities, but, but in communication complexity, very little. Sometimes separating two classes is actually equivalent to separating the monotone versions of the associated models, like it is uh, the case here. So that's a huge project. More characterizations and more separations. Okay, thank you. There's a bunch of uniform versions of these proof systems, like S12 is like pre resolution, and T12 is like that, is, is resolution. And they have, well, Sam has these theorems that, beautiful theorems that show like the privily total functions in those systems correspond to the, these circuit classes. So there was no connection. In query complexity, classes. somehow. What? In query complexity, though. No, but I'm saying it's very similar. You're doing the, n not the connection, not the lifting theorem, but the, the, connection that you're making, some of them, where there's a uniform version of them where it was known. It's also a lot of them as well, so, like, put it on the water, and have a particular version. I think for the same, I mean, that's the same reasons, yeah. yeah. And the same could probably say more of it. Well, uh, there's certainly connections between T12 and res log and PLS. Okay. That are, that are, um, I don't know if it's exactly precisely the equivalent, but it's very close. Yeah. I'm wondering how tight you can get the lower bound to be. Let's say you don't take all n cube linear equation, but you take just the linear number that come out of. Yeah, the that's how you optimize right. parameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, at the moment, the lifting theorem is approved in such a sloppy manner that we lose a lot there already. I, I think the best um, record at the moment is cube root of n, where n is the number of input bits, as a run ras and others. And we could maybe match that if we worked hard, but but pr prove a constant size gadget lifting that would. <coughs> Any other questions? Let's thank Michael.